Chapter 1 A Tour of the World Chapter 1 takes you on a macroeconomic tour of the world. It starts with a look at the economic crisis, known as the Great Financial Crisis, that has shaped the world economy since the late 2000s. World output growth, which typically runs at 4% to 5% a year, was negative in 2009. The world economy recovered after that till it was hit with the COVID-19 crisis in 2020. That must be fresh in your mind. Chapter 1 Outline The five sections in this chapter cover some of the major macroeconomic issues confronting countries today and looks at the three main economic powers of the world the United States, the Euro area, and China. Section 1.1 looks at the crisis. Section 1.2 looks at the United States. Section 1.3 looks at the Euro area. Section 1.4 looks at China. Section 1.5 concludes and looks ahead. If you remember one basic message from this chapter, it should be Economies, like people, get sick, high unemployment, recessions, financial crisis, low growth. Macroeconomics is about why it happens and what can be done about it. Section 1.1 The Crisis The financial crisis started in the U.S and quickly spread to the rest of the world. This crisis was the event that preceded the Great Recession. From 2000 to 2007, the world economy had a sustained expansion at an annual average rate of 4.5%. In 2007, U.S. housing prices, which had doubled since 2000, started declining, leading to a major financial crisis. Collapse of housing prices caused major problems for banks because people stopped paying their mortgages as the value of their houses became less than the mortgages they had. Banks had bundled mortgages into complex securities packages which could not be valued easily. Banks began to collapse and other banks were unwilling to lend to them in order to stay viable. This caused the financial crisis. The financial crisis turned into a major economic crisis with falling stock prices. In the third quarter of 2008, U.S. output growth turned negative and remained so in 2009. Through the trade and financial channels, the U.S. crisis quickly became a world crisis. Figure 1.1 shows output growth rates for the world economy, for advanced economies, and for emerging and developing economies 2000 to 2018. As you can see from this graph, output growth rates fell across the board during 2007 and 2008. Advanced economies, emerging and developing economies, and the world all show the same decline. The vertical axis represents percentage of output growth rate from negative 4 to 10 in increments of 2, and the horizontal axis represents the years ranging from 2000 to 2018 in increments of 1. Figure 1.1 shows that the world economy had a sustained expansion from 2000 to 2007. Growth rates were positive the entire time. Then, housing prices in the U.S. started to collapse in 2007 leading to a financial crisis which quickly turned into a major economic crisis 
that spread to the entire world. By 2009, average growth in advanced economies was minus 3.4%. Growth in emerging and developing economies stayed positive but was 3.5 percentage points lower than the 2000 to 2007 average. Since then, thanks to strong monetary and fiscal policies and to the slow repair of the financial system, most economies have turned around. Figure 1.2 plots stock price indexes for the United States, the Euro area, and emerging economies from the beginning of 2007 to the end of 2010. The reason that the financial crisis quickly turned into a major economic crisis is because stock prices collapsed. The indexes are set equal to 1 in January 2007. The vertical axis represents stock prices index equal to 1 in January 2007, ranging from 0.0, .0 to 1.6 in increments of 0 0.2. And the horizontal axis represents the date ranging from January 2007 to November 2010 in increments of 6 months. Note that by the end of 2008, stock prices had lost half or more of their value from their previous peak, causing consumers and firms to cut back on consumption and investment spending in the economy. Through trade and financial channels, the crisis spread to other countries. Some of the cutback in consumption spending by US consumers fell on imports of foreign goods. This meant that exports of those countries fell and so in turn did their output. Regarding the financial channels, as US banks badly needing funds in the US repatriated funds from other countries, it caused problems for banks in those countries. Lending came to a halt leading to a decrease in spending and output. Also, in several European countries, governments had accumulated high levels of debt and were now running huge deficits. Investors fearing whether debt could be repaid started asking for much higher interest rates. In response, governments tried to drastically reduce the deficits by cutting spending and raising taxes. This led to further decline in demand and output. This came to be called the Euro crisis. Section 1.2, the United States. When economists look at a country, the first two questions they ask are, how big is the country from an economic point of view? And what is its standard of living? To answer the first, they look at output, the level of production of the country as a whole. To answer the second, they look at output per person. The United States is big, with an output of $20.5 trillion in 2018, it accounted for 24% of world output. The US standard of living is high. Output per capita is $62,500, which is close to the highest in the world. Economists also look at three other variables to study the health of a country. Output growth, that is, the rate of change of output. The unemployment rate, which
which is the proportion of workers in the economy who are not employed and are looking for a job. The inflation rate, the rate at which the average price of goods in the economy is increasing over time. Figure 1.3 shows the total output, population, output per person, and share of the world output for the United States during 2018. The map of US is highlighted in the map of North America. A comment box pointing the US map reads, the output of the United States is $20.5 trillion. The population is 328 million. The output per person is $62,500 and its share in the world output is 24%. Table 1.1 shows growth, unemployment, and inflation in the United States, 1990 to 2018. Source of the data is IMF and World Economic Outlook, October 2018. Output growth rate is the average annual rate of growth of output of GDP. Unemployment rate is the average over the year and inflation rate is annual rate of change of the price level using the GDP deflator. The US economy in 2018 was in good shape, leaving the effects of the 2008 2009 crisis behind with one of the longest economic expansions on record. The average output growth rate, unemployment rate, and inflation rate numbers for the U.S. economy for the pre-crisis years 1990 to 2007, during the crisis years 2008 to 2009, and post-crisis years 2010 to 2017 are shown in Table 1.1. During the crisis years, output growth was negative. Unemployment increased from 5.4% to 7.5% and inflation rate lowered from 2.3% to 1.3%. By 2018, the U.S. economy recovered nicely, leaving the effects of the crisis behind. Output growth rate returned to 2.9%, only slightly below the 3% average for the 1990 to 2007 period. Unemployment rate, which increased during the crisis and its aftermath, it reached 10% during 2010, has declined steadily and reached 3.7% in 2018. Inflation is low, equal to its 1990-2007 to 2007 average of 2.3%. Figure 1.4 shows that conventional expansionary monetary policy was used in the United States to stabilize the economy. The federal funds rate was lowered from 5.5% in July 2007 to nearly 0% in December 2008. Here, the horizontal axis represents date that ranges from 2000 to 2018 in increments of 8 months. The vertical axis represents a percent that ranges from 0 to 7 in increments of 1. The graph is a zigzag curve that rises from 5.5 in 2000 to almost 6.5% in 2001, then falls to 1 in 2004, further rises to 5.5 in 2007, 
falls to 0 0.1 in 2009 and finally it rises from 0 0.1 in 2016 to 2.4% 2 by 2018. The federal funds rate in 2021 was lowered to zero again in order to deal with the shock to the economy from the COVID-19 crisis. In the light of these issues, we want to look at the two main macroeconomic problems facing U.S. policymakers. The first concerns the short run, namely whether policymakers have the necessary tools to handle a recession. The second is how to increase productivity growth in the long run. Let us take the first problem. Do policymakers have the necessary tools to handle the next recession? So, do policymakers have the necessary tools to handle the next recession? Federal funds rate in 2021 is again at zero. Problem of low interest rates and the zero lower bound. Why did the federal funds rate stop at zero? This constraint is known as the zero lower bound. If it were negative, then everyone would hold cash rather than bonds. Why are low interest rates a potential issue? Low interest rates limit the Fed's ability to respond to further negative shocks. Low interest rates may lead to excessive risk-taking by investors to increase their returns. Zero lower bound is a constraint since the Fed cannot increase aggregate demand in the economy by lowering interest rates any further. At negative interest rates, where people have a choice between holding their assets in cash or bonds, everyone will hold cash which pays zero interest rates rather than bonds. Conventional monetary policy becomes ineffective at this point. Are there other tools that the Fed could use? Can fiscal policy help? The answer to both questions is yes. You may have heard about all the tools that were used by the policymakers to deal with the economic crisis that occurred as a result of COVID-19. The second problem is how to increase productivity growth in the long run. Although aggregate demand is important in determining the level of output in the short run, economic growth and the standard of living in the long run depend on productivity growth. Table 1.2 shows average U.S. productivity growth by decade since 1990 for the private non-farm business sector and for the manufacturing sector. As you can see, productivity growth in the 2010s has been, so far, much lower than it was in the previous two decades. Source of the data is FRED database series PRS 85006092 and MPU 490063. Think why this may be happening when there have been so many improvements in information technology. Some economists feel this may be a case of a few bad years. Others feel measurement issues make it difficult to measure output and that productivity growth may be underestimated. 
still others feel that the major gains from the current inno innovations in information technology may already have been obtained and that progress is likely to be less rapid at least for some time. Productivity growth is important for a sustained increase in income per person, but since 2010, it has been only about half as it was in the 1990s as shown in Table 1.2. The slowdown in productivity growth is worrisome because the standard of living, especially for the poor, may not increase, leading to increasing inequality. Section 1.3, the Euro area. In 1957, six European countries decided to form a common European market, an economic zone where people, goods, and services could move freely. Over time, 22 more countries joined, bringing the total to 28. This group is now known as the European Union, EU, and its scope extends beyond just economic issues. In 2016, the United Kingdom held a referendum in which the government was given the mandate to exit the Union. The United Kingdom withdrew from the European Union on January 31st, 2020, leaving 27 countries in the European Union. In 1999, the EU formed a common currency area called the Euro area, which replaced national currencies in 2002 with the Euro. The Euro is the official currency of 19 out of 27 EU countries. These countries are collectively known as the Eurozone or the Euro area. The Euro area faces two main issues today how to reduce unemployment, and how to function efficiently as a common currency area. Table 1.3 gives the numbers for output growth, the unemployment rate, and the inflation rate in the Euro area for 1990 to 2018. Source of the data is IMF and World Economic Outlook, October 2018. The average output growth rate, unemployment rate, and inflation rate numbers for the Euro area for the pre-crisis years 1990 to 2007, during the crisis years 2008 to 2009, and post-crisis years 2010 to 2017 are shown in Table 1.3. Just as in the United States, the acute phase of the crisis, 2008 to 2009, was characterized by negative growth. Whereas the United States recovered, growth in the Euro area remained anemic. Indeed, while this is not shown in the table, growth was negative in both 2012 and 2013. Growth has now increased, reaching 2% in 2018, but the unemployment rate remains high at 8.3%. Inflation remains too low, below the 2% target of the Euro European Central Bank, ECB. Figure 1.5 shows a map of the Euro area with economic statistics for the entire Euro area and some major Euro area economies in terms of their size, output per person, and population. For the Euro area as a whole, the output in 2014 
was $13.4 trillion. The output per person was $40,143 and the share of world output was 17.4%. As you can see from the numbers in figure 1.5, the euro area is a strong economic power. At the current exchange rate, between the euro and the dollar, its output is equal to two-thirds of U.S. output. The EU as a whole has an output equal to 90% of that of the United States. The countries that belong to Euro area in 2018 are Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Germany, Slovakia, Austria, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Ireland, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Slovenia, Malta, Greece, and Cyprus. A box on the upper left corner reads, output is $13.7 trillion, population is 341 million, output per person is $40,170, and the share of world output is 16%. A table displays the economic point of view for four countries in 2018. The table data are as follows. France, output is $2.8 trillion, population is 65.1 million, and output per person is $42,900. Germany, output is $4 trillion, population is 82.7 million, and output per person is $48,600. Italy, Output is $2 trillion, population is 60.7 million, and output per person is $34,300. Spain, output is $1.4 trillion, population is 46.3 million, and output per person is $31,000. The euro area faces two main issues today, how to reduce unemployment and how to function efficiently as a common currency area. Some economists believe the main problem with unemployment rates in the euro area is that European states protect workers too much. To prevent workers from losing their jobs, they make it expensive for firms to lay off workers. Also, to protect workers who become unemployed, European governments provide generous unemployment insurance. But by doing so, they decrease the incentives for the unemployed to, to take jobs rapidly. This also may increase unemployment. While the average unemployment rate for the euro area was 8.3% in 2018, countries like Spain had an unemployment rate of 15%. Much of the high unemployment rate was the result of the crisis. Even when Spain had its lowest unemployment rate of 8%, it was nearly twice that of the United States. Some economists believe labor market rig rigidities with too much protection for workers are the main problem. However, Unemployment is not high everywhere in Europe, even though there are generous unemployment benefits and protections for workers. This leads to the question, what these countries with low unemployment in the Euro area are doing and can that be copied elsewhere in the Euro area? Figure 1.6 shows the striking evolution of the Spanish unemployment rate since 1990. After a long boom starting in the mid-1990s, the unemployment rate decreased from a high of nearly 25% in 1994 to 8% by 2007. But with the crisis, unemployment exploded again exceeding 25% in 2013. It has declined since then, but still stands at 15%. The vertical axis represents 
presented from 0 to 30 in increments of 5, and the horizontal axis represents the years ranging from 1990 to 2018 in increments of 2. The euro area has proponents and critics with valid points on each side. Supporters of the euro argue there are economic advantages due to no more changes in exchange rate and its contribution to the creation of a large economic power. Opponents of the euro argue there are drawbacks of having a common monetary policy across euro countries with differing economic conditions and the loss of the exchange rate as an adjustment instrument within the euro area. Section 1.4 China Figure 1.7 shows the total output, population, output per person and share of the world output for China during 2018. China is in the news every day. It is perceived as one of the major economic powers in the world. Is the attention justified? A first look at the numbers in figure 1.7 suggests it may not. True, the population of China is enormous, more than four times that of the United States. But its output, expressed in dollars by multiplying the number in yuan, the Chinese currency, by the dollar-yuan exchange rate, is still only $13.5 trillion, about 60% of that of the United States. Output per person is about $9,700, only roughly 15% of output per person in the United States. The area of China is highlighted in the map of Asia. A common box pointing to the map of China reads, the output of China is $13.5 trillion, the population is $1.39 billion, the output per person is $9,700, and its share in the world output is 16%. However, if purchasing power parity, PPP measure is used to calculate the output in China, it is equal to $25.3 trillion and output per person in China would be $18,100, a bit less than one-third of the output per person in the United States. This is a more accurate picture of the standard of living in China. Second reason why China gets so much attention is because it has been growing very rapidly for the past three decades. Why China is seen as one of the major economic powers in the world is shown in Table 1.4. Since 1980, China's output has grown at 10% a year for three decades, which implies doubling of its output every seven years. This shows the strength of an emerging economy like China. China's rapid output growth has been driven by high accumulation of capital and technological progress and China's transition from central planning to a market economy. The slowdown after the crisis is considered to be desirable as more of output would go to consumption instead of investment. Achieving the transition from investment to consumption is the major challenge facing the Chinese authorities today. Crisis slowed down growth but not much because lower export demand was offset by increase in domestic investment demand through fiscal expansion 
by the Chinese government. Unemployment barely increased in 2008 to 2009. Section 1.5 Looking Ahead Macroeconomic issues are not limited to the US, the EU, and China. At any point in time, there are other countries with fascinating economic issues we can study. We could have also looked at other regions like India, Japan, Latin America, Central and Eastern Europe, and Africa. Think about the issues to which you have been exposed in this chapter. The crisis. What caused it? Why was it transmitted from the United States to the rest of the world? In retrospect, what could and should have been done to prevent it? Were the monetary and fiscal responses appropriate? Why the recovery has been so slow in Europe? How was China able to maintain high growth during the crisis? How can monetary and fiscal policies be used to fight recessions? What are the pros and cons of joining a common currency area such as the euro area? What measures could be taken in Europe to reduce persistently high unemployment? Why do growth rates differ so much across countries, even over long periods of time? Can advanced economies achieve sustained growth without increasing inequality? Can poor countries emulate China and grow at the same rate? Should China slow down? The purpose of this book is to give you a way of thinking about these questions. As we develop the tools, models you need, I will show you how to use them by returning to these questions and showing you the answers that the tools suggest.